Guys, let's talk about sumps and filtration. Okay, so as a company, we supply custom-built fish tanks all across the UK. The one thing that we do do as a company is we don't just take we don't just take your measurements and your requirements and what you want and then send you back a quote. What we will always do is we want to talk to you about your tank, about your lighting, your system, your setup, just to make sure it's at its absolute optimum. The key things we will always go through is your filtration, how you're planning to and how you're planning to filter the tank itself. Anything over a 300 litre tank, I will recommend to sump the system, go with a sump filtration. Now, one of the most common questions or responses that we get with that is usually, I've always wanted to go with a sump, but I don't know what I'm doing. I've always had canister filters, so I'm not too sure how sumps work. Uh, sump scare me is one we've, we've had before. So usually with them customers, what I would do is I'd put together a video, just giving a quick tutorial of how a sump works, how you can set it up and obviously how much more it benefits. Now, what I wanted to do is the first video I wanted to put up on the YouTube channel was going through setting up a sump, how they work and how they can benefit your tank. Now, what I will do as well is at the end of the video, I'll go through my sort of key reasons as to why I would always recommend a sump over canister filters um, and my key and main reasons why for me personally, they are much better than running a canister filter, especially on larger tanks like these. Okay, filtration. Now, usually when you order a custom built tank, anything under five foot will come with a free chamber sump. Now, your tank builder should recommend this, um, or not so much recommend it, but they will turn around and tell you how many chambers your sump is gonna have. Guys, just remember on that note, when you are ordering a custom built tank, you can completely customize how you want this sump to work. If you are new to having a sample, it's the first time you're gonna have one, go with the tank builder's recommendations or just do a, little bit of, do a little bit of revision. Speak to the guys or speak to your friends or members on the Facebook groups that have had sumps and filtration, you know, leave comments for me in the videos below and I'll happily, happily answer any sort of questions. But anything sort of under a five foot tank, you will end up or you will pretty much as standard be sent a free chamber sump. Now, what a free chamber will mean, my t mine's a little bit different, I've had this completely built to my specification which I'll go through at the end and I'll explain the differences. But with a three chamber sump, what you will pretty much get is you'll have your first chamber, which is your inlet, this is where your water's coming down. You will then skip these two parts here that I've had to put in. And you will then jump into your media chamber, which is your third chamber, uh, sorry, your second chamber. And then you'll have your third chamber, which is your outlet. So you can see here the pipe work just going up, running back up into the tank. Because usually when you have a free chamber sump, what you will do is on your inlet, which is this chamber here, you will just run your sponges underneath the pipe work, okay? Or some people now are starting to run them vertically. The difference that I had done to mine is I wanted an overflow to then fall down through my sponges. And okay? I've got a little bit more media down the bottom there as well. So the difference of between mine that you won't see on a, say, a standard free chamber sump is you won't have, I had this custom built to a nine inch and I specifically wanted sponges on here. Now what would usually happen on that free chamber sump is you will have inlet and you will have a break here, okay, for an underflow and that will then carry into your media chamber. Now, one thing personally I would always recommend and it's the way I've done this, is when you have a standard sump come through, what it will usually do is you have a downflow and it go through the sponges, and then what you will have is you will have a second pane here, which will then cause the water to come back up and over the top. Now, as that carries across the top, what will then usually happen is it will then do this, and then this is pretty standard on a free chamber sump, it will then flow back down and into the thing. These guys are hungry, wait for their dinner. Beautiful. Now, one thing I'm not a fan with that is, for me, when, when the water is coming back up and over the top, for me, too much water can carry over the top of the media and back down. 
and into the tank, meaning it can completely skip traveling through. Even though it's gone through biological filtration in the first chamber, uh, sorry, mechanical filtration, it's gonna miss the biological filtration. Obviously not all of it, but it's gonna, there's gonna be a percentage. So one thing, again, going back guys, you've got the opportunity to custom build the tank. So the main thing I wanted to do on this one was I wanted an over, under, I've got a K1 chamber so it travels through. And as you come back to here, it comes back down and it actually flows up through the media. So all the water has to pass through the media to then flow back down and back into the, into the return pump. Okay, so one of the other main questions that we get asked or one of the main worries of when people go over to the sump is the way that they work and the way that it filters through and also them overflowing, which is a concern. And when you set up your first sump, and you set it up for the first time, it's the first time you've dealt with one, even myself, or even when I set up a sump for another customer or another sump for one of the fish tanks, you always do worry about it flooding. Nine times out of 10, or 99.9% .9 of the time, the only way a sump is gonna flood is through human error. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna give you a breakdown, an example of how to set the sump up and how you can also market, work out your water volumes and how to have your sort of inlets and outlets and your pumps and your water levels to ensure it doesn't overflow. As you can see here, I've got lines marked on the sump itself. If I take to this end, again, same thing. I've got two lines marked just here and here, and I'll explain why there's two on this one. What this does is this indicates and tells me that when the sump is running, the water levels need to be between these two lines, okay? We go back to this one I've got because I've got this is a oh this is a high overflow so the water line is meant to be close to the top I'm 100% happy with that but again as you can see I've got the two lines just to know exactly where it's at so the reason being them lines are there and the reason also this one isn't flowing to the top what happens is what I'll do is I'll just move this out of the way so you can see here you've got water level here and also in the weir and the overflow. What happens is, is when that pump turns off, the water level above this glass panel, okay, now also from the outlet, which I'm gonna go into in a second, will drop down back into the sump through the pipework. Now what will also happen is the outlet, which I don't know if you can just see up here, Water will also travel out of there, back down the pipe, and back into this chamber. What I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna turn the pump off quick. So as you can see, what will now happen, it's just my auto top up going off. I'm just gonna turn the K1 off quickly. But what will now happen is the water volume that is above the overflow will drop back down into the sump, but I know because the original lines, the water level when running, was in between these lines, it physically cannot overflow. Okay, so if you ever have a power cut, uh, you obviously need to turn the pump off for your maintenance. There is physically not enough water above that overflow to fill up the sump. Okay, now, like I was saying before, with human error, Here's my line, my safety line. If my tank is filled up to here, as you can see, that is filled up from there to there. If my water was running at this level and I were to turn the pump off, it's coming straight out the top, okay? Again, human error. When you first set up a sump and you start to work, work around and play with it, you will, this is one of the things is, is you will have to work all this out. So I'm just gonna start that again. So then what, as normal, what we'll do is the water will start dropping again when you turn the pump back on, and it should, nine times out of 10, go back to where your water levels were at, okay? So when you first set up the sump, like I said, you will have to calculate all this, and you will need to know every sump is different, okay? Your liters per hour, um, how much is flowing through your sponges, your, if you've got K1 or your media and you're into your last chamber, um, depending on what PPI sponges you run in, every sump is completely different. Now what you also have is depending on your flow rate, it will create 
a different height of water in the main tank which will also mean when you turn that pump off you have more water volume above that glass overflow to then drop back down into the sump. With overflowing, if I can show you here, these dividers here, okay, if you have a problem or restriction of flow or these block up and create too much water, the water can always, if it can't get through, it can travel. There's about, there's about a 10 mil gap there between the top of the sump and the, and the, baff, and the uh, baffle. So the water can always travel over and into the next chamber. Okay, so you don't have to worry if your sponges block up or if your media obviously moves and gets compact and water can't get through it, you still have the opportunity or the water will still overflow into the next chamber and continue the flow through the sump. But when you first set up the tank, fill the sump up through putting water in the tank. So fill, fill the tank up, let the water overflow, drop down and let it fill the sump up that way. When this water gets to obviously a safe, uh, level you're comfortable with, turn the tap off, turn your pump on, and then that's when the playing around, that's when the games begin of just making sure you're getting the right, the right flow. All right, so like I said, just keep, get your mark, get your, get your Sharpie out, get your marker out, turn the sump on and just have a look where your levels are. Like I said, and this is, when you very first set up, this is trial and error. Again, now the way I have run mine differently, like I said at the beginning of the video, I wanted mine to specifically drop down through sponges of my choice. Now, the re one of the I'll, I'll touch on it now. One of the key reasons I'm a big fan and will always recommend sumps over canister filters is if you have them designed right and built right, personally with an over under over under flow, you can control a hundred percent of what the water touches and what it has to go through before it comes back out into the tank. So what I've got here is I'm in complete control of my water going through every single type of filtration that I've got here and set up before it gets back into the tank. So the sponges will drop down, uh, sorry, the water will drop down through the sponges. Okay, it has to go through them sponges to get into the next chamber. Like I said, a bit more biological filtration at the bottom just to prop the sponges up but also added bacteria. K1, okay, I'll, I'm going to do a video on K1 and the sort of benefits, basically what this does is this helps regenerate uh, fresh bacteria um, in, the, um, in the cycle itself and in the sump and obviously knocks off and kills off any of the sort of old dying bacteria that's not as strong as the new stuff grown through. Water then has to travel down here and up through the biological filtration so like I said all my water has to travel through this to get back into the final chamber to then return into the tank so again we're talking about if we're talking about resins so I've got C3 resins here from Countryside Aquatics which removes nitrate from the tank I try to run a zero nitrate in my tank for the crystal clear water and just to help with the fish growth that's why it's not heavily planted because obviously it wouldn't be it wouldn't be the right environment or parameters at the moment for plants to grow. So what it also means, as I said, is this water has to travel. I'm actually gonna make something more of a box or a cube out of um, egg crate to make sure the water has to travel through. But like I said, all the water has to travel through or past that C3 resin to get them get to the return pump. So one thing I was gonna to touch on was my key reasons as to why I would always recommend a sump filtration over canister filters. Now. I think the main thing is, I think everyone really wants to run a sump system because like I said, the benefits just completely outweigh canisters. Like I said, canisters, yes, they are cheaper to set up initially. They are obviously easy to run. You put the pipes, you put the media in the, in the chamber, uh, sorry, put the media in the canister, put the pipes into the tank, turn it on, off you go, you're up and running. Yes, there is a little bit more of initial playing around and teething problems when you first set up a sump just to get all the flow rates and the water levels correct. But like I said, once you get them first two, three months out of the way, you will be a master on your sump, especially on yours, you will know if a problem, if a water level changes in one of the chambers, you'll know exactly what the issue is. If, if it's not functioning right, or the, the water level in the last chamber where the pump is, is, is too high or too low, or the same with the first chamber, like I know if this water level comes too high, I know my sponges are blocked and they're ready, they're ready for a cleaner or the floss. So, I'm probably gonna say there's three key things for me as to why 
I would always go with a sump over canister filters. First thing, like I mentioned earlier in the video, is you have complete control over what your water is touching, going through, to then get back into the tank. So for me, I know, like I mentioned, all my water has to go through the mechanical filtration of sponges. It has to, it has to be fine-tuned, it has to have all the mess on the, and the muck and all the particles removed from the water. Like I said, with it, with obviously with my setup, I have full control. The water has to go through uh, the sponges. It then has to go through the K1. It then has to travel up through the uh, media and then before it then gets to the return pump and comes back out into the tank. So I know what water is coming back out into that tank has been completely, has gone through the nitrogen cycle, it's come in contact with media, uh, uh, the beneficial bacteria, the sponges, it's been fine tuned, it's gone through the resins, if there's anything you want to take out of the water, if you've got your carbon in there to remove medication, um, wh whichever whichever it may be, like I said, I use C3 resin and sometimes I use some phosph uh, phosphate remover. Um, like I said, I know I'm in 100% control of what my water is doing as it goes through the filtration. The second thing, and I think it's probably one of the biggest benefits from an aesthetic point of view, is you have absolutely everything inside that sump. So you don't have to have anything in the tank whatsoever. Inside the tank itself, there are no heaters, there are no wires, there are no pipes, from the canisters, from the inlets and outlets, there's absolutely nothing inside the tank. Okay, all you've got, or all I've got, is sand, decor, plants, rocks, and the fish. Okay, so you don't have to have any eyesores, you know, even if you don't have a painted background, there's no wires hanging down the back. You know, if you've got as, as an example, if you've got lights on there, say a tank this size without a sump, if I had lights on there, that would be three or four uh, wires hanging down the back from the lights. We're talking maybe three or four heaters. So again, that's another three or four wires. You would be looking two canisters. So you'd be looking two lots of pipe work, uh, sorry, four, four lots of pipe work hanging down the back. You know, look a real eyesore. So like, like I said, everything is placed in the sump. So you have heaters. Okay, all my heaters are in the sump. Just a little back here, I've just got an hang on or a stick on uh, filter running for if I ever need to QT, um, quarantine or hospitalise or grow out a fish. You know, that's always running, that's always cycled. Again, I don't have to run it up in the tank, it's just nicely hidden away. Okay, so I've got my heaters, obviously a backup filter for if it needs to be done. Okay, here we go, I've got my UV. Okay, again, all hidden away, all running, all this is running into the sump again. So there's no, again, if you're running a UV, if you're running a closed loop system on the tank itself, you don't have to have the pump in there tucked up in the corner and then a pipe kicking the water back into the tank or down into the sump. Again, it's all hidden away. I've got more heaters down here, I've got all my resins, okay. Everything is in the sump, which then allows you as a tank to just have, like I said, nothing but fish, decor, sand, plants. Okay, so the third reason what I, what I would always go over a sump is just the general ability to filter and turn over water. I have a, roughly about 50, well I have 50 litres of Cirrociparax media in this, so we're talking roughly, probably gonna look at, looking at about 15 kilos, maybe a little bit more, maybe about 20 kilos of, uh, media i've got 50 liters of k1 in there as well okay and then also you've still got sponges on that on top of that as well this tank would probably need a minimum of two fx6s to turn over the tank adequately now you're only looking inside that even if you'd have to go out and buy more media than the fx6 actually comes with but you're only going to be looking at a maximum of about I think it would be seven or eight kilos if you are lucky in both the filters, canister filters, FX6s combined, okay. I've got four, five, six times that amount in this sum. So I know that I've got an adequate amount of media, biological and mechanical filtration to filter this tank correctly and stock it as much as I want. 
Okay, so the other problem as well with effort, with canister fillers, FXs, whether it's the e Himes, Oasis, whatever it may be, is when they place on the box or they claim what it is, so again, say that you've got a canister fill that turns over 3,500 litres per hour, the way that is usually assessed is the pump motor speed, but it's also with the water flowing through the canister with no media in, no sponges, no pipe work, no gravity pull on the water, pulling the water back down. So when they say you're doing a 3,500 litre per hour canister, or that's what you have, you're probably looking at about, I would probably say, between 60 to 80% of that turnover is realistic. Especially, again, once you start to pack in more media, because a lot of the, a lot of the uh, canisters come with a lot more space, because they don't always send you enough media to fill up the chambers with. Um, you start to put filter floss in there. Um, again, it really start, it really starts to flow it slow that slow down the flow. If you've got a really high tank, you know, if you're looking at sort of 30 inch, um, again, that's a lot of gravity pull on the water. So again, the third sort of benefit for me, like I said, with the amount of filtration and the water volume turnover, is obviously you can buy pumps. Um, sort of the if you're looking at the sort of TMCs, you know, there's pumps running up to sort of 12,000 litres per hour. Now you may not need it, but it's good to have that turnover. Of, capability of up to 10 times per hour, your 60 or 10 times per hour tank volume turnover is your optimum turnover. So I run this at about I run this at about eight eight or nine times per hour. I know it's at its optimum and like I said I've got the pump that is capable of doing that. Okay so one key thing or one last key thing I'm going to touch on when setting up a sump. So I'm going to go through things like ball valves and how to reduce noise of your sort of overflow. Um, trickling water you may get a siphon noise but this is an absolute essential thing I want to mention we set up tanks on a regular basis and again we do all the pipe work and installation now one thing that is easily forgotten about is as mentioned before the water level when you turn the pump off the water level that's above the glass overflow will drop back down into the tank Now, what you will also have is your water level will be above your outlet. Now this is absolutely essential. When you turn your pump off, the water that travels back down through the outlet will create what you call a back siphon. So what that means is that will continue to pull water out of or through the outlet, which will then drop down into this chamber as it will come back down through the pump. So an easy thing to do, these guys are worried about what I'm up to. An easy thing and an easy mistake to do is have this outlet facing completely down or too deep within the water. So when that pump gets turned off and it creates a back siphon, even if the water level has dropped below the glass overflow, if this outlet pipe is still submerged, the back pressure will then continue to pull water out of the tank. So. What you need to make sure, I'm gonna try and do this, sort out my ladder so I can show you. What you need to make sure, I'm gonna try and do this as quickly as possible, is when the pump is turned off. Okay, so I'm now gonna show you what's happening up here. As this water starts to drop, so you can see here, look, the back pressure's starting. What's going to happen now, and the essential thing you have to do is you have to make sure that you create just maybe about 10 mil gap between the top of the pipe, okay, on the inside and the water level. Once that gap appears, what that does is that will then will release the back pressure, so it will stop the water being pulled back out of this pipe. So if that outlet was like that, so still in the water, completely submerged, that would continue to pull water until that gap appears, okay? So like I said, enough gap just to release the air out the outlet. Okay, so start of the process. Outlet, you will always have coming up through the weir, kicking water back out into the tank. You've got your inlet, which is the pipe here. Now this third pipe is just what you call an overflow. It's, ignore the sponge that I've got in there. That, is, that was me just playing around with flow uh, the other day. And so what this does is you only usually, nine times out of 10, have an overflow pipe if you've got a ball valve, because obviously this then raises the water level and it allows that safety 
because if you turn it too much, if you restrict the flow too much, water level comes too high and it just allows the water to drop back down into the sump. Brief touch on noise. Two of the most common issues you get with, again, having a sump filtration is the noise and some people don't like it. Um, you get the trickling water um, or you get the siphoning noise or you know like when you flush the toilet and the, and the water is traveling down the toilet itself. So them two, them, two, them two noises are caused by two things. One, you've got your drop level of your overflow. Okay, this is a little modification I've made just to help reduce that. And then what you also have is, like I said, the suction being caused from the pump will create a swell and again, an air suction down through the inlet. So this is your inlet pipe here. Okay, this is obviously where your water drops down into the sump itself. One of the key things you can do is all valve. Okay, there's two, there's, two, there's two things you can do with the siphon or the suction noise. Okay, the first, first one to look at is a ball valve. Now again, as a custom built um, specialist or anyone else that you may be ordering from, double check that your pipe work, if you're ordering the pipe work with them, okay, or like I say, if you're going out to do your pipe work, get your ball valve on your inlet pipe. Okay, so this is the pipe where the water is falling down through. Okay. Now what this does is with this you can reduce the flow so you can see it's slightly twisted now what that then does is it raises the water level that is in the weir so then it creates such a height that there's no air being sucked in and it stops that siphon noise okay so for me so like i said these bubbles that are coming down now as the weir is filling up that's just the air being sucked in because the water level in the weir isn't high enough at the moment but what this has now done is reducing the flow with the ball valve, it will now create a higher water level in the weir, which will stop that suction noise. Okay. Now the other option that you have is you can get something called uh, a Dorso, um, invented by an individual over in America, it's named after him. Um, in the UK, you can get them from, I've just ordered one myself. You can make them, they are easy enough to make. Uh, but uh, ND Aquatics can send them out if you know your pipe where all that is is effectively it is just a u-shaped pipe that sits on your inlet pipe and what that does is it stops air being caught into the pipe and it pulls pulls just water down so to give a quick rundown of the way I've set mine up and the reason why I've said oh, we had a, a customer Martin message me yesterday as to how to set the sponges up now there's a key way that everyone does it and what you will usually have is you will have your standard foam coarse or fine foam and then you will have your filter floss at the bottom. I do things a little bit differently for two main reasons. One, for general maintenance and how often I have to wash or clean the sponges and also how often I have to clean the rest of the sump which at the moment is none. If you're in the marine industry, you'll see it on 99% of tanks. The water will come down through the inlet pipe and it will first come in contact with a filter sock or some form of roller um, and the water will be fine-tuned before it touches anything else. Okay, the guy, you, you tend not to have sponges at all whatsoever with marine tanks because again, they, they just wreak havoc with your water parameters as they build up and collect stuff. I run my floss first, purely re reason being is what that means is my sponges okay yes it does defeat it does it does defeat the object of the fact that i've got jap mat standard fine or cut or fine sponges um i run floss on the top surely re re reason being all my water all the i don't do i don't put some i don't put the pump into feed mode i don't turn the pump off when i'm feeding so i get a lot of food debris and a lot of um good heart beef heart um, that falls down obviously into the sump. But, so the reason I have floss on the top is one, it catches all that for me. As you can see, completely clean. Sponges, nice and clear, clean. Can't really see the K1. Again, if I turn off, completely clean. We go into the last chamber, the media, completely clean. And the final chamber, again, it's just spotless. See, a little bit of build up in the first chamber. Obviously the flow should be kicking it. The floss catches everything. Every three or four days I replace the floss and put some new stuff in and it keeps the rest absolutely clean. 
and spotless. So, through floss first, like I said, I just replace this every few days because it just keeps everything else absolutely clean. I've got jack mat, which obviously these things are really good for picking up the large particles, obviously if they were to get through, um, but also they are great for surface area for building um, and growing bacteria. This is a very, very small PPI. This is a 45 and 35, okay, so the standard fine sponge that you get on, say if you went on Amazon and ordered fine sponge, even the fine sponge on Amazon, you're probably looking at about sort of 80 to 100 PPI. Actually, it's probably higher than that, it's about 120, 125. This is 45, this is 35, so really, really fine sponge. Um, into the K1, you'll see which I just explained, it's traveling through the two holes here and here. Water has to travel through that. Up through the media, there's no choice. Like I said, it then comes out through these two gaps here, down and then up. Okay, overflow down through the C3 resin back to the return pump okay so that's the general rundown of sumps obviously if you're looking guys do not be scared if you're looking to order one if you're looking to upgrade from canisters over to sump do not be scared do not be worried go for it they are easy enough to work out figure out um, pipe working again your custom build your, your the the company you purchase the tank from they should offer um, to do the pipe work for you if you're a little bit too if you're a little bit worried about that it's pretty straightforward you do you do pipe you do pipe work once you'll be able to you'll be able to um commission any sort of tank whatsoever um if there's anything i've missed if there's any questions that you've got if there's any queries or concerns leave a comment in the video in the comment section below and like i said i, I can answer back if i get a repeated question um over and over again i can do another video that's not an issue at all but Hopefully this gives you a sort of good general rundown of how some works, how it would benefit, and like I said, if there is any issues, it's your fault, not the sum's fault. Okay, till next time, take care.